Well, welcome to week two of our series, Behold Your God. Uh, the idea we're looking at is that we become like what we behold. The things that we have a perspective of, that we view, we tend to become like those things over time. And so we're asking this question in this series, what is God like? Uh, prior to 1799, uh, the ancient Egyptian writing system known as the hieroglyphics uh, was really largely unknown. We knew that there was a formal writing style, but we couldn't tell what those little hieroglyphs, those images said. They were undetected. We hadn't decoded them. We, we, uh, they essentially were mysterious. We didn't know what those things said until the year 1799 came along. There was a stone that was found called a Rosetta Stone. And this is, if you've heard of the Rosetta Stone language teaching, this is where that comes from. The, the Rosetta Stone actually had three different languages on it. It had the ancient Egyptian system of the hieroglyphics. It also had a, a system called Demotic. And then it had ancient Greek. And so because there was an understanding of ancient Greek, uh, people who are really smart scholars, they took this Rosetta Stone and they could use it to take something that would have otherwise remained a mystery and bring clarity to it. They were able to use this Rosetta Stone as this thing that unlocked, that decoded this language that otherwise would have been unknown. Today I want to talk with you about what I, an attribute of God that I believe is well, kind of like the Rosetta Stone of His attributes. This attribute helps give clarity to the other attributes of God that otherwise would remain mysterious and unknown. That when we understand this attribute we're going to talk about today, it actually unlocks the meaning of all of God's other attributes. And so if you're here and you find yourself, you're, you're a seeker, you're somebody, you're asking the question, who is Jesus? Who is God? Can I know who God is? Then the focus of today for you and what I pray for you today is that you get a clear picture and a clearer understanding of who God is through understanding this attribute. And for those of you, if you're here and you're, you're a follower of Christ, you are on your journey with Him, my prayer for you is that you gain a deeper understanding of who God is through understanding this Rosetta Stone of His attributes. So if you'll open with me, we're going to look at several scriptures today, but the first is going to be Exodus chapter 15, verse 11. We find a question being asked here that reveals this first attribute. And so Exodus chapter 15, verse 11, we find these words, and as we read these words, we're going to see this first attribute of God that we look at today. Exodus 15, verse 11, it says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? Majestic in holiness. Awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. We know Leviticus 11:45 that God identifies himself as being holy. And so here's the central truth, the takeaway, and then I want to show you how this intersects with your life and is significant today. The, the central truth is this, that God is holy. That's the starting point from which we're going to work today. This word holy uh, occurs some 700 times throughout the scriptures. Uh, the verb form of this, which means to make holy or to consecrate something, occurs another 200 or so times. And what I want you to see today, we're going to look at two questions. The first is, what is God's holiness? And then the second follow-up question is, how can God's holiness change us? Because the focus of this study, of this series, is, you know, we've said this idea that we become what we behold. As we behold God, a clear picture of Him, ideally we want to become more like Him. And so we start with the question, what is God's holiness? I want to share with you three key insights into the nature of God's holiness. And then we're going to look at this question, how can we be transformed as we understand, to a better degree, what His holiness is 
So the first key insight, when we think about God's holiness, this Rosetta Stone that clarifies everything else, is that God's holiness refers to both His moral purity and His separateness. So God's moral purity, the idea there is that God is perfect. He's the He's the standard of perfection. He's sinless. So it refers to his moral purity, but it also refers to his otherness, his separateness. So his holiness is not just something that he does. It's not a, it's not a virtue. God's holiness is part of his essence. It's part of his being. For those of you, if you've ever studied philosophy, you might be familiar with the word ontology, that God's holiness is his ontological reality. It is the nature of who he is. Now, let me try to, to illustrate that through a couple of examples. Um, the first is uh, my dad's baseball cards. I think I've shared this story with you before. Uh, years ago, I was a young kid, got into collecting baseball cards. My dad told me, hey, I used to collect cards as a kid. I wonder if they're still around. And so long story short, uh, at that time, my dad was a big Yankees fan. So we had like Mickey Mantle and all the players of that age, Hank Aaron and Willie Mays. And so a boy like 11, 12 years old, when I hear this, man, I just start salivating, thinking, oh, could this be true? We make the trip from Wister, Oklahoma up to Red Oak, Oklahoma and go down into the uh, basement of my grandparents' uh, home. And we find over there in the corner, there's a black trash bag, open it up, and voila, like over 3,000 of these antique vintage baseball cards. But here's the thing about those cards that, that makes them separate, that makes them other or set apart. You can find other old baseball cards if you at one time could go to a baseball shop, I don't baseball card store, I don't know where you would go now, but you can find other cards somewhere what makes those set apart is that they belonged to my dad. And so you know this. If you have something that's special or unique or set apart to you, in this case, if it's baseball cards, if somebody took those baseball cards and said, I'm going to use those to build a fire, or I'm going to use those to, I'm going to put glue on them and create some kind of a craft project, I would say, they're, they're, you, you're going to not do a lot of things. You're not going to do that with those baseball cards. There's this, this strong reaction in me because I perceive those cards as set apart. Not because of a virtue that they perform, but because of the nature, the essence of what they are. They're my father's cards. Now, if, if that illustration didn't work, I've got one more. <laughs> the other illustration is is of children. Think about if you, if you have your own children or if you have nieces or nephews. Uh, yesterday we were able to celebrate um, my little youngest son Hudson's turned one year old and one year old and it's just a great time of celebration and as I think about my own children and, and you can do the same in your own lives whether it's a niece, nephew, whatever. The thing that makes them set apart to you and this is where they differ from God. The thing that makes them set apart to you is not always their virtue and what they do because they're not always morally pure and morally right though my kids are most of the time <laughs> occasionally they do they do fall short here's what makes my children unique and here's what makes your children your nieces your nephews unique and special is because they're yours right they carry your last name or your blood flows through their veins. It, it, it's not because of what they do. It's the essence of who they are. When we think about God revealing himself as holy, we need to grasp this idea that it is his moral purity. It's how he acts. It's what he does. But friends, it's not just what he does. It's the very essence of who he is. And the reason today, I just kind of want to jump into and look at the text, is to, to make clear to us and show you how significant it is when we think that God is holy. There are a lot of attributes that we can consider and, and really um, rightly evaluate and worship God for. But this 
this attribute of God's holiness comes closer than any other attribute to showing us the very nature, the very essence of who he is. And this leads to the second key insight that we see about God's holiness. And that is that God's holiness is the culmination of all his other attributes. Uh, I look at God's holiness as, as kind of like an umbrella attribute. So you have God's holiness here, and all of his other attributes fall under this core attribute of his holiness. One man named R.C. Sproul said it well. He said, God alone is holy in himself. The word holy is used as a synonym for his deity and calls attention to all that God is. And he makes a statement that is very profound and eye-opening when he says, it reminds us that his love is holy love. His justice is holy justice. Right? It's separate it's different than. The nature of it is different than anything else we see. His mercy is holy mercy. His knowledge is holy knowledge. So any attribute of God that we see reflected in the scriptures or ultimately and finally through the person of Jesus, we see that that is a holy attribute. It is different. It is set aside. So God in His righteousness, His righteousness is holy. His majesty is holy. His grace is holy. Everything about God and every attribute that He possesses and that He extends into this world is itself holy. And what that means, frankly, is that we can't really grasp or understand any of the other attributes of God. God's love, God's mercy, God's grace, God's goodness, God's faithfulness. We can't really grasp any of those attributes until we first see as the writer Jen Wilkins said, Jen Wilkins said, she said, no other attribute is joined to the name of God with greater frequency than holiness. We can't understand these other attributes until we see them through the lens of His holiness. And that's why I started by saying this attribute, it's the Rosetta Stone. And we'll talk later in the series about God revealing Himself and He is knowable. We'll look at God is love. We'll, we'll see other attributes of God, but they all need to be seen through the lens of here, His holiness. So that is the second key insight. The third key insight of God's holiness is this. God's holiness is the first thing you need to behold if you want to become more like Him. We as a human nature and our, our essence, we, we like to create images. Uh, we like to manufacture, to modify images. It, it's interesting, within wardrobe at one time, there were these things called girdles. And now there are things that push and pull and tuck and enhance. You know, the wardrobe that, that alters an image. Um, if you think about photography and, and makeup and those sorts of things, you may recall like in the 80s and 90s there was a thing called glamour shots. And that's like one of the worst mistakes of humankind, how that ever happened, but they were really a big thing in the day. Uh, glamour shots, it was a way to kind of manufacture or create a certain image. And I think most uh, pointedly now where we see that is on, if you have a smartphone, you can open it up and in your camera, you most likely have a lot of editing software, and that editing software will include something called a crop feature. And the crop feature is great because at one time you had to have like Photoshop and this entire program, but now with the crop feature, you take your phone out, you see, get the picture, something in there that you don't like, you can remove the image or the portion of the image that you don't like, and you can, you can actually replace it with something different. You can minimize the bad, and you can enhance what you perceive as good. And most people, when they post images now, younger people, especially on social media, they've been created, they've been curated and, and manufactured to look a certain way. That works in photography. Maybe that works a little bit in wardrobe and makeup. But you, and you've experienced this. It doesn't work as well when you try to crop an image when you think about a person. 
It, it doesn't work very well when you try to get to know somebody and you say there's something about them, I really don't like this, perhaps it's a dating relationship and we've all perhaps been there and done that. Um, in the dating relationship, you see something about the person, think, ah, that's not very presentable, I don't like that, I'm going to crop out. I'm just going to pretend as if they don't have this terrible ego. Right? I'm going to crop out their temper. I'm going to crop out their controlling nature. I mean, we've all done this, right? We, we get enamored with this vision, and so we create this image. The problem, and most of us have experienced this too, when we crop out an image, we create this artificial kind of caricature. Sooner or later, we have to deal with reality. And there are a lot of people who, when they're dating, they've cropped out that bad attitude or they've cropped out that selfishness, but it keeps popping up. And it leads to frustration. It leads to disillusionment. It leads to, I don't think you're really the person I wanted you to be. And and here's what I think all of us are wise to acknowledge. In the same way we can crop out certain features of a person, We can tend to crop out certain attributes of God. And and when we crop out those attributes of Him that maybe at first glance we don't like or they're not that palatable to us, what will happen is we will assume things about Him that are not true. And we will expect things from Him that He will not do. Now, we don't have to go far to pick on anyone, but you you don't have to travel far to see and to find groups of people who have cropped out certain images of God that they don't like, and they've enhanced other images. I reference one group simply because they pride themselves in this. There's a a church called Westboro Baptist, and they're the group that if you see somebody holding up the signs that says, God hates blank, 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 at like uh, the funeral of somebody who has fallen in service to our country. That's, that's the group. We can all look at them and say, they've cropped out a portion of God's character that they should not have cropped out. They're not seeing Him fully. They assume things about Him that are not true. But what's also the case, you and I have the capacity to do that as well. We can assume things about him that are not true, and maybe even more pointedly, we can expect things from him that he just will not do. You may have lived through this in your own life, or if you've not lived through it or experienced it, somebody else that you know has. Um, You've wanted or expected God to do something for you. You've expected him to answer a prayer a certain way. You've expected him to come through and offer deliverance. You've expected him to change a circumstance. You've you've had a certain expectation of God, but he's chosen not to do that. And it's, it's my firm belief that when we crop out God's holiness... When we set it aside, when we say, I want to enhance the things that I really like about God, His faithfulness and His joy and His hope and His love and His peace and His comfort, I I want to, to magnify those things and crop out these other things. What oftentimes will happen is we find ourselves in, in relationship with Him being frustrated, disappointed, God, why haven't you done what I think you should be doing? It may very well be because you're expecting things of him that he's just not going to do. And and I'll just say this, for us as a body, my genuine heart and genuine prayer is that, that we would want to see God as he is, not as we would want him to be. Somebody, it's been variously attributed, but they've made the statement, they said, uh, God made us in his image, and we have been returning the favor ever since. I mean, the idea is we, we want to kind of create this caricature of God that, that we're most comfortable with. And much of what has, has driven the, the content, I think, of what 
is often taught is, is it's viewed through the lens of um, what will people want to hear? What will they enjoy hearing? Uh, what will they be sure and, and go and tell their friends and, and they'll come back? And, you know, what do people want? And consequently, this significant Rosetta Stone attribute of God's holiness tends to get cropped out. And so I would say if you, if you want to have a, a healthy understanding of who God is, it really begins with an understanding of his holiness. God is holy. It's his essence. It's his nature. And so to take this, we, we said in this series, we want to have a blend between doctrine and practice. We want to have a blend between our understanding, kind of a theological idea of who God is, but we want to make that practical. And when we say we become what we behold, when we behold who God is, we begin to become different people. And I want to share with you just briefly uh, from Isaiah 6, four ways that you can be transformed. And I want to ask you whether you're there at home or you're here with me now. As we walk through these, I'm going to walk through them briefly. But I want you, kind of the posture of your heart, to, to transition, if you can, away from uh, sort of being a spectator and your focus is on a guy up on a stage. I, I want you for just the next five, six minutes to focus on just the presence of the Lord. So we call this a worship service, which means God's presence inhabits this place. And we long for him to show up, to reveal himself, to work among us. And so uh, for the next few minutes as I walk through these, what I'd like to ask you to do is just to, to think about how your life personally can be transformed as you behold God's holiness. As Daniel, if you come up and, and just begin playing in the background for us, Isaiah chapter 6. This is a passage that some of you are you're familiar with. In verse 1, we find the background to this is in the year of King Uzziah's death. He says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. And so Isaiah experiences something here. He beholds something here that all of us at one point will behold. Verse 2, Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. The first way that your heart, your life can be transformed by beholding the holiness of God is heart felt worship it's my contention my belief that far too many of Sundays I've, I've settled for church attendance I've settled for showing up I've settled for putting my seat my, my rear in a seat or settled for going through the motions and, and really if we picture the reality of God like him in his nature in his being is present with us through the person of the Holy Spirit. When we come to see this God for who He is, this holy God, what it creates in us is not, um, not a willingness or a desire to go through the motions and offer lip service to Him. It creates in us this heartfelt worship where we say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There's this powerful portrait in Revelation 4 where God has revealed Himself and, and these creatures, we sang about it earlier, they're around the throne. And it says, they, they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And it's as if they utter that, that repeated phrase, holy, holy, holy. And then they bow and they take just a breath and they open their eyes again. And they're struck afresh and anew. They just said it. But they've got to say it again. And I don't know what that does for you. But for me, I want my heart to sing that song. I don't want it to be just words on a paper or words on a screen. I want my heart to be in tune with the reality that when I behold this God, I'm just I'm struck with this vision that He is holy, holy, holy. That, that this would be a place, we would be a people where there's genuine, heartfelt worship. 
that comes from the depths of us. And whether the song was written 200 years ago or two years ago, we really don't care. Because God is holy. And that song is just a medium to point us toward this master, the one who's supreme and the one who's sovereign. Heartfelt worship. The second way that you and I can be transformed by beholding God's holiness is sincere humility and brokenness over sin. We find in verse 5, Isaiah responding after the temple is filled with smoke and the foundations are trembling, quaking at his presence. In verse 5, Isaiah says, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Notice this next phrase. For my eyes have seen. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I don't know the last time that you've been broken over your sin. But I pray even just in this moment here that God as His Spirit does His work and draws us into His will and forms in us this image of Christ that He wants to represent to the world into which we go, that there would be a measure of brokenness within us. We can't help but see ourselves as broken and ruined when, when we see, when we behold God in His holiness. And what we find is that, that brokenness, the humility over sin... It leads to, it unlocks something beautiful and something rich. And if you're here today and you don't know where you stand with Christ, what I mean by that is you don't know if you're, if you're saved or you're lost or if you've really been born again or where you are. I want you to hear this, this third way that your life can be transformed. As you're beholding Him and engaging in perhaps heartfelt worship and you're aware of your sin, you're broken, number three, And let this be today, Lord, God-given holiness and cleansing from sin. In verse 7, Isaiah says, He touched my mouth with it, with this coal that he received. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. One of the uh, amazing things about Jesus, and one of the things I love about Jesus, is that this is what He does for us. When we look to Him as our Savior, when we look to Him as the one who is capable to cleanse us, when we place our faith in Him, Jesus forgives us. He removes our sins from us. We see it in Isaiah. In Hebrews 10, we find in verse 10, it says, And by that will we have been, and here's a key word, sanctified. What this essentially means is we have been made holy. It is such good news, and I hope to God you hear it and receive it today, that you can be made holy. Not because of what you do. Friends, that can become your very essence. Now, I know that sounds strange and bizarre, but your very essence and nature can change. You can become a saint. The the very person that you are, your ontological reality, can become someone who is holy. Not because of your virtue or because of your deeds, but because God changes your nature. His blood, the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, can flow over you and His blood can flow in you if you become a child of His. I love the whole passage. I won't go through all of it, but I just want to close with with verse 14. 
of Hebrews 10. It says, For by a single offering, he, yes, has perfected. Has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. There's a, a powerful thing that happens in, in the Old Testament uh, when, when the law is given. If you're familiar kind of with the, the backstory of what happens, the people make some really dumb decisions and God sends judgment upon the people for creating this golden calf. And a number of things happen, but the sum of that, what we find in Exodus 32 28, is that. The sons of Levi carried out this mission that God gave them, according to the word of Moses. And it says, And that day, about 3,000 of them, 3,000 men of the people fell. If you go to the New Testament, not, not the day when the law was given, but, but this the day that the Spirit was given, the day of Pentecost. I just want you to think about this. In Acts 2.41... It says, so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now, I I can't say definitively, like, what God's purpose in 3,000 here, 3,000 there, but I personally believe it's likely a little more than coincidental that the day that, that God's law came into this world, the law that shows us who He is as the lawgiver, that, that charts a course for us between life and death, that, that on that day we learned this lesson, that because God is holy, death can come to those who disobey. But friends, that's not the end of the story. We see in the New Testament, through the coming of Jesus and the ushering in of the Holy Spirit, that He purchased and brought into this world that you can receive life. And so my, my encouragement today, if, you, if you're seeing a picture of God's holiness and you think, I have to stand back, I have to stand far away, that would be the case were it not for the man of Jesus Christ. He's made it possible for you to draw near to a holy God by making you holy the last way that your life can be transformed is this. It's simply through joyful surrender to God's mission for your life. We find in verse 8, Isaiah saying, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. Me. Uh, Supremacy inspires surrender. It inspires service. And not just, I'm going to show up and go through the motions and fill a seat or sing a song. This image of God, and this is why I'm so passionate about this, and I hope that you are passionate about this as well. It's because this image of God... The more we see God for who He is, the more we are compelled to serve Him. Not just out of a sense of duty. And and friends, that may be where some of you have been today. It may be that you come in here this morning and you think, I hadn't been in a while, I need to make sure and show up. Or I haven't checked in online in a while. And I've been watching this other church and I need to check in here with Grace Chapel. Or whatever it is, You, you may just have this sense of, I need to do this. We behold what we become. When you behold this image of God, you can become someone who has joyful, not not dutiful, but joyful, eager surrender to His mission for your life. And so what this does is it switches, it it flips your, your motivation and your heart and your desire and your reason. To be part of fellowship and worship and the extension in your own life of how God wants to use you outside of this setting here or the one you find yourself there in your home. And that's my prayer for you. Is that I don't know if it's the case you need more heartfelt worship. If you need more humility, brokenness over sin. If it's the case that you need more holiness and forgiveness 
Or ultimately, if you just need more joyful surrender, we just pray today that God will transform your heart as you behold His holiness. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for communing with us and being with us here in this moment. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit would be absolutely free uh, to work in us. God, I want heartfelt worship. I need brokenness, sincere humility and brokenness over my sin. I thank you and I'm grateful for the holiness that you give and the forgiveness and the cleansing of sin that you bring through Jesus Christ. And ultimately, I want to leave here today with joyful surrender to your mission for my life. And I pray that for every person who is here physically and every person who is online today. In the great name of Jesus, amen.